Today we're going to talk about CSS for Clark Kent, SAS for Superman. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, this presentation is going to be a little bit about the journey of me discovering SAS. Um, but uh, I'm known as John Albin. Um, my actual last name is Wilkins, but almost everybody thinks my last name is Albin. Totally fine. I get it all the time. Not a problem. Um, I am Drupal.org user 11297. I've been using Drupal for over eight years now. Um, and you can find me basically everywhere as John Albin, uh, Twitter, um, any place like that, IRC, you'll find me there. Um, I'm actually writing a book for O'Reilly on SAS and Compass. Um, the presentation today is not a pitch to, for you to buy my book, uh, <laughs> mostly because it won't be published until later this spring, <laughs> um, but it will be awesome. <laughs> um, and uh, it may contain some lemurs. Um, so uh, the reason why I decided to write a book is because of how excited I got about SAS. Um, and uh, I've been doing web development for a long time. Uh, I got started in the industry in 1993. That means to 2013. I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, a lot has changed. Um, if you look at the way the CMS is now in 2013, uh, you have Drupal. And of course in 1993, the CMS, well, I was the CMS basically, right? <laughs> I was in charge of all the content, making pages, making sure the markup wrapped around the content. I was the CMS. So um, when I was searching for images uh, for my slides, uh, I, I remembered that in fact, we actually did have mobile devices in 1993. Uh, here's a great picture. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, during this 20 years, I've, I've been able to sort of look at the sort of long view of front-end development, um, and I've been able to, like, learn stuff sort of gradually, um, because when I first started, we didn't have CSS at all, right? I've only been doing CSS really since, well, I dabbled in a little bit in, like, 1998, but basically just doing font colors, like, that's it. Um, and then, like, 2001, that's when I really started to use CSS for layouts and try to get rid of all the, you know, cruft that we had in the HTML that was talking about presentation. Um, I discovered Drupal, like I said, eight years ago in 2004, I think. And uh, the reason why I started using Drupal was because it was really, before that I was being really dumb. I was building a, you know, custom website for all of my clients and, um, it, it made no sense that I was building it all by myself and basically building a completely new thing for each new client. And I discovered open source and the power of sharing and working together and reusing stuff, right? But we don't really have that in CSS the way that we're usually building sites, right? So if you want to reuse a technique that you saw on a blog or you've used previously in a uh, project, what do you do? Copy and paste, right? So you're copy and pasting stuff from old projects. Uh, you see a couple lines of CSS that you need to move from one selector over to another rule set. Uh, more copying and pasting. It's just copying and pasting and copying and pasting and <laughs> copying and pasting over again. <sighs> and it's, you know, that's our code reuse, right? <laughs> so it's really obvious we do have a problem that we need to get fixed. But the, the, the sort of unique problem with this is that it is a complete sort of architectural rethinking about CSS, and that's a really deep sort of thought to have. And we are constantly being bombarded with new technologies. These are just sort of a sampling of stuff that I thought of in like five minutes that people in front-end development need to be aware of or need to think, maybe I need to know something about it so I can ignore it, right? <laughs> I mean, we're screwed. This is a lot of stuff. <laughs> so trying to re-architect our CSS, that's, that's a real big challenge. Um, how many people here have heard of Nicholas Gallagher? A couple people. He's a really well-known front-end developer. Um, on Twitter recently, uh, he said, are you new to front-end development, uh, front-end web development? Here's a secret. 
No one really knows what they're doing. <laughs> no one really knows what they're doing either. Yeah, this is, uh, this is completely true. We're, we're trying to figure things out sort of together. We're like, hey, I tried this thing. It kind of worked. And then you build on top of it, right? You improve stuff. Um, there is a really interesting technology called uh, object-oriented CSS uh, that uh, Nicole Sullivan came up with. Um, and people have been sort of riffing on that idea and improving it. And now we have SMAX, uh, SMA CSS. This is another technology that's basically, it's built on top of OCS or on those same ideas. Um, and we're, we're figuring things out together. Um, and I wanted to sort of discuss and talk about today about all the different things uh, that we can learn together. Right, so I need some water. So we have lots of stuff that we have to learn, right? Um, and it can be very overwhelming. You know, Clark Kent, he was, he was decent at his job. He struggled, he had a lot of stuff that he tried to get better at it. Um, you know, but, but Lois Lane kicked his ass. She was always getting the scoop. <laughs> she was always better than him. And you kind of feel like that for the vast majority of, of front-end developers. You're just sort of treading water. You're trying to improve yourself and uh, you're, you're trying to get better at stuff uh, gradually because that's the only pace that you can sort of make um, with everything that you have to do all the time, client work and all the new technologies, right? So uh, my journey with SaaS began two years ago at Palantir.net, which is where I work, a Chicago-based company, a great group of developers there. Um, and two years ago, we decided, hey, you know what? Let's try SaaS on the next project. I have no idea if it's actually going to work or if it's going to be useful because, well, again, I got that huge list of stuff that I need to learn. But I'm going to try SAS for this next project and then, you know, see what else I need to do on the next project and all that, right? So, and the reason why we went ahead and did it uh, was because there was zero commitment. I mean, there really isn't any commitment when you're using SAS. This is a great thing. So, SAS, how many people here actually don't know anything about SAS? Okay. Good. I mean, not good, but you know, <laughs> I'm not having a completely redundant slide. Yay. Uh, SAS is basically CSS plus some extra features. And what that means is that it has the exact same syntax as CSS, but it has these additional features. So if you write a CSS file like you normally do, that is also a completely valid SAS file. Um, and the way that you use SAS uh, on a website uh, is basically you have like a, a little compiler that converts your SAS files, like the normal CSS plus the extra features, into normal CSS, right? So you have this, this tool running that compiles your SAS files um, and turns them into CSS. So the way that you, you know, the way, so like, I mean, because browsers don't understand SAS files, right? Drupal doesn't understand SAS files. But they don't need to know because you're generating CSS and you just hand off that CSS to normal, you know, normal browsers. They understand that, right? So we realized that because of this, we can write SAS and if we like really, really hate it, we can just generate the SAS or the CSS one last time and then throw our SAS files away. Like, done, but we didn't lose any work, right? We don't have to restart the project because we were using SAS. We've still got the CSS that's generated. Another reason why there's zero commitment was because it's automatic compilation. I know when I said, oh, it compiles it into CSS, people were like, ooh, an extra step. Not really. Um, all the tools that are you know, SAS tools, they do automatic compilation. So you're editing your SAS file, you hit save, and immediately that tool converts it into CSS. So your browser sees the CSS as soon as you hit reload, or if you're using live reload, of course, it sees an updated CSS file and that gets loaded in. So all of these things made it a no-brainer for us to at least try SAS. And I, I encourage you, this is the reason why you should just go ahead and try SAS on your very next project. Um, I have to get this sort of obligatory 
you know, how do you install SAS and Compass, right? I haven't talked about what Compass is. That's like slide 30 or something like that. We'll get there. <laughs> um, command line, how many people hate the command line? So bullet point two is the one you want to listen to. Don't worry about bullet point one. <laughs> the command line, this is free. I use this option. Um, there's a, oh right. There's a really long URL that you're not going to remember or write down or anything. Don't worry about writing it down. Uh, my slides are chock full of URLs. The URL at the very top there, this is bit.ly slash sass dash four dash superman. That is a link uh, to the project page, or sorry, the, uh, the session page for this session. And I've already got a uh, comment that I need to post to that session, which will have all of the URLs. So you don't need to post those in. Actually, I should probably do that right now, come to think of it. Because you might need those if you want to follow along. So let me try this. Really fast. I can move this brown. I gotta get this browser over here for, for later in the session anyway. Here. So bit.ly. I said it. This works. So I should actually try it. SAS for Superman, right? There we go. Loads up the session. Um, Allow URLs just those two. Good. Okay. So bit.ly slash sash for Superman will get you here, and then you can follow along all these links. Uh, you can even use your mobile device for this um, if you don't have your laptop with you. Um, and back to the slides. You can find my mouse. There it is. So this is a link to a blog post that discusses in detail how to actually install it, but it boils down to just a single command. Uh, if you have Ruby on your system, which you've, if you have a Mac, you already have Ruby. If you have Windows, there's a little Ruby installer you can find. The blog post talks about where to find it. Once you have Ruby installed, you run this single line from the command line, sudo gem install compass. It will actually install compass and sass for you um, with this single command, and that's it. You're done. Bullet point two, these are for the people who don't want to use the command line. There are a bunch of GUI apps that you could actually use, right? Compass app for $10, uh, Fire app for $14. This is one that I actually use um, in addition to the command line. Um, the, the developer who, who makes this app uh, actually will give you a free license if you have contributed patches to SAS or Compass. Since I have contributed patches to the Compass project, you know, I asked him a free license and he sent me one. It was great. So it's, it's a really handy utility too. Um, then we also have CodeKit for $25. Do you use CodeKit? Uh, you know, okay. Who uses CodeKit? Love you love it? I hate it. Yeah. Or less end SAS you mean? Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, if, if you're using like a, CodeKit does, does like SAS and less and like CopyScript and like all these other things. Uh, so if you use all those different technologies, CodeKit is interesting. If you just use SAS and Compass, yeah, uh, FireApp has been great. The thing that I really like about FireApp There's other ways. There are other ways to install. Does it compile SAS as well? It compiles it, but it's free and open source. So you can use it. Okay. I mean, they have the same. You have to go and use their service to use it. They just put out the one. Yeah, for, the, for those of you. Oh, okay. So, so Morton here is, is heckling me. Uh, for those of you who are listening to the video, um, he's talking about how Live Reload does this also. There, it, it's available with the Mac App Store. Um, so, that's another option. Uh, so anyway, you have choices. Right? So you don't have to use a command line, but you can because it's free um, and it's really easy. So, 
Um, when we started using SAS, um, I didn't know anything about Compass yet. People kept were telling me right off the bat, like, got to use Compass, got to use Compass. I'm like, uh, just give me a minute. I got to learn SAS first. So I was using this command at the command line, SAS dash dash watch. Um, and basically what it would do is uh, if you told it, uh, you know, watch this SAS directory uh, and compile to the CSS directory, it would take everything from your SAS directory, look for all the uh, SAS files there, and generate CSS files. And because you're watching, it would continually watch that folder. So you basically run this command from the command line, and it just sits there and is like, okay, I'm watching for changes. I'm going to watch for changes until you tell me to stop, right? Control C in this case. So it just, every time you save change to your SAS files, boom, it's in the CSS file. Um, we really liked using SAS watch command because it had a nice sort of alliteration. The Sasquatch um, had lots of fun development team. Um, so, so getting started with this is, is pretty, pretty simple. Um, now we're going to jump into some, some sort of live demos, basically, um, where I've taken screenshots because you should never do live demo <laughs> during a presentation. So I took screenshots of my live demo, and then you can follow along and try to do it live demo, and we may crash the server um, if you try to do this all at the same time. But not my problem because I have screenshots. <laughs> so you go to bit.ly slash superman1. Um, this will actually, and I'm going to do it here right before everybody else does it, hopefully. Um, again, where's my mouse? Here it is. Um, This will open up a really interesting uh, website called SASMeister, um, which will basically do live uh, compilation of your SAS code in the browser, just so you can see and sort of play around with stuff, or like do presentations, right? <laughs> so uh, here I have a, uh, um, a SAS file on the left side, um, and it's generated in the CSS. I'm actually not going to uh, be showing you this screen anymore because I'm going to go back to my presentation. But screenshot, same thing, right? So let's talk about variables and colors, color functions. Variables in SAS are one of the most fundamental things that I've wanted in CSS forever, right? You have a color and it's in your CSS file like 80,000 times, right? And then you decide, hmm, I don't like that color. I'm going to change it. And then it's this global search and replace and maybe you screw something up and ugh just wanted a variable where I can define the color once and then reuse it. That's what variables are all about. They're not just about colors, right? You can define anything. But here we've defined blue uh, using, you know, this is standard CSS, by the way, the RGBA or RGB um, that's in CSS3. So I've specified my color in RGB um, and, and saved it to uh, the blue variable. If it's, this is the only thing in your SAS file, uh, it's not going to generate in any CSS, right? You've just uh, declared a variable, it's not outputting any CSS. But now we can start using it. So here's my rule set. I've specified that the color is blue. It's this variable. And the output, of course, is the actual uh, CSS, right? In this case, SAS is, is being sort of extra smart. It knows that some browsers don't know about RGB. So even though RGB is standard CSS3 syntax, it goes, hey, you know what? I can convert it. I know how to convert it to regular hex value. So I'll just do that for you. So it does. Um, and here's an even cooler thing, right? So here's we've got a blue. We're using RGBA. Um, again, regular standard CSS3 syntax. We're going to define a new variable called dark blue, and we're going to use this color function, which allows us to manipulate colors. So we're going to darken it by 10%, and that will as you can, whoops, there we go. <laughs> yes, if you actually then include that in a rule set, it'll get generated out, right? And you can see, uh, yeah, so what you could see, I can't quite see, it's falling off the edge of the screen, oops. But anyway, the, the color is actually darkened. The background color um, is a standard blue, and the other color is a darkened version of that. So there are a lot more than darken and lighten. Um, if you go to uh, the SAS documentation, again, there's a link from 
the uh, presentation page to the SAS documentation, you'll discover that there's, there's like 15 different ways you can manipulate colors. Um, this can be really handy um, and a really, really easy way to play around with colors, especially if you're designers, right? So you're like, oh, this, I, I want to darken this other color, right? And then you change your mind, you want to actually more dark. All you need to do is change like 10% to 15%, and now you've made it more dark than it was before. Um, so let's go on to nesting. So th the way this will make the most sense, actually, I'm going to run over here, is don't look at the C SAS yet. Look at the CSS. Um, we see this in Drupal a lot, right? Where you have uh, a selector that is like styling a menu, and then you like want to style a link for that specific menu, and you have all these different rules that are very repetitive because they've got like the same sort of beginning part to their selector. Especially with menus, you end up with like three or four different parts of your selectors. Kind of embarrassing, but that's the way it is, right? Because Drupal CSS, Drupal 7 is kind of crap, and there's no other way to do this very cleanly. Uh, so you end up with this, a bunch of like really redundant, but not completely redundant CSS selectors. You can save yourself a lot of typing um, and make it a lot less error prone if you start using nesting of rule sets. So here, we're, we, we're taking the CSS and we're converting it into SAS in our minds, right? So we've got the same selector here. Um, again, our margin zero. Um, and then we're gonna, this second part of the rule set becomes nested inside this other rule set. You can see that the opening bracket is here, but the closing bracket for it is not down until line eight. So, so by nesting it inside there, basically what we're telling SAS is, at this spot, when I get to this nested rule set, take all of the parent selector and uh, prepend it to the selector when we ge go to generate it. So we grab this part, stick it on the front there, menu link, and that's how you create nested lists, or nested rule sets. Um, this is really handy, a lot less typing, a lot less errors. Um, and let's look at nesting properties. Uh, this is another sort of like typing shortcut. Right? So we have a lot of times where we have margin top, margin bottom, you can nest properties that have these sort of similar beginnings to their properties. Like the, the border series has like border, border top, border radius, all of those, those can be nested in the same way here, where you have like border here, colon, brackets, and then radius and all that stuff, and it just combines it and generates the CSS into normal CSS. Um, that's handy. I use it occasionally, um, but it's really good to know about. Okay, I'm watching the time. It's been 30 minutes already, and we're halfway through the slides. So I have another 15 minutes to finish all the slides. You excited yet? <laughs> Common and output styles. So SAS can actually generate different styles of generated CSS, right? This is the, uh, the expanded style. This is one I've been showing you in all the other slides. Uh, you can see that the, uh, the CSS output is pretty standard. Um, oh, comments though. This is a normal CSS comment. It gets output in the expanded style um, this is a SAS style comment, slash slash. This is very similar to the PHP, or this is exactly the same as PHP comments that use slash slash. They never go into a generated file. So if you use a SAS style comment, it'll never go into your generated CSS. Um, and let's look at, this is the nested version. You can see nested style. Um, and basically it'll indent, any nested rule sets will become indented. So the closing bracket for this first rule set is still here. So it's, it's not nesting it, it's not creating invalid CSS, right? It's just indenting it so that it, the generated CSS looks a little bit more like your original SAS. Eh. Compact, um, basically it, each rule set, single line. Again, I don't really use that one. The ones that I use are the expanded and this one, compressed. In the compressed version, 
it removes all, or all non essential white space. So any returns or any spaces that aren't needed are removed. So you don't need spaces in between brackets and selectors or properties, that gets removed. The only spaces you need are like, you know, this, this value of this property requires a space in between there. So it doesn't strip that out. And it also strips out the normal CSS. So it strips out absolutely anything that doesn't need to be in there. Um, this actually, I think it works better than Drupal's sort of aggregation and, and compression. Yeah. Because um, Drupal has to basically, it uses like this really unholy regu regular expression to try and parse your CSS and generate it. Uh, it is not as good as the SAS one. Right. So the way that we work at, at Palantir is we, while we're doing development, we're using the expanded mode. Um, and that allows us to like see things a little bit easier while we're developing, you know, doing in inspecting styles and all that stuff. Uh, but then when we're ready to go to production and move it and deploy it, we turn on the compressed mode and poof, single line. No comments, no extra white spaces. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. And, and how many people here have used the Zen theme? Yeah, so you probably know that there are a lot of comments in Zen CSS, right? <laughs> this is the, the whole commenting thing, that got me so excited about SAS. Because <laughs> people complain, like, it's so bloated. I'm like, it isn't anymore. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, <laughs> question. So uh, the it, it, it does like try to do something to it, but there's nothing. It's it's already done better than it could. So it goes, oh okay. <laughs> yeah, it'll still. Yeah, the the compression code in Drupal won't affect this compressed code, but it will still aggregate it. So it'll you know bundle it up with other CSS files that are part of Drupal module, right? Uh, parent selectors. Now, this happens all the time. Um, there is a library called like Modernizer or something. You might have heard of it. Um, and I don't use it too often. So I think that the classes that it creates on the HTML classes like has this and has that, right? <laughs> um, I'm joking. It's <laughs> uh, Drupal, of course, has lots of body classes. So it, outside the body tag, lots of body classes. The nice thing about the parent selector is when you're styling a particular piece of your Drupal site, um, you can create a nested rule set, but then specify this parent selector should go here. So basically, if we didn't have this ampersand here, this is the, the parent selector, you would get this, the generated output would be sort of just the opposite here. It would be dot, button, space, has border shadow. But because we put the ampersand here, this thing says, when you generate the CSS, look at the parent selector and jam it into this spot. So um, does that make sense? So the ba basically, the nice thing about this is that it, it's, it allows you to sort of logically group your, your styles, right? So you know, oh, I'm styling the button thing here. And, and having, when you look at your CSS normally, this whole section here can sometimes jar you as far as when you're reading through it, go, is that part of the same thing? Oh, oh yeah, it is, because the way at the end of the selector is the same thing. But how, how many levels deep can you go? So how many levels deep can you go? Um, and, and still accept the, the, so how much memory do you have in your computer? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's basically, the, the, it can go as far as your computer can go. Um, I would not recommend more than like two or three levels. <laughs> um, but it, you know, the parent selector will work just fine no matter how deep you go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so my goal, my goal, not what I actually accomplish, but my goal is to write rules, uh, rule sets that uh, only have a single class in them. Like, so basically I, my goal is not to use any nesting at all because of what I've learned about the smacks. But I don't know, I've, I've never cheated yet. 
Um, so yeah, limit the number of nesting that you do, but it can be super handy when you have to use it, and I've always had to use it. So, Martin. The ampersand? Yeah. I never accidentally put ampersand in my CSS oh, selector, so. <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, you know, down here, I actually read the, the reference material. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> I, re I read the docs, I know it's kind of crazy. <laughs> um, it's part of the reason why I write a lot of documentation. <laughs> Um, okay, so yeah, here's one more thing that you can do with the with the ampersand. Um, you know, you can also remove the space that you would normally get. So if you have a nested rule, instead of it being a space colon link, you put the ampersand right next to it, and when it's generated, it takes the parent selector and shoves it right where the ampersand is, which just says there's no space in between these things. Okay, a colon link. Right, that creates you know valid CSS here. Actually, the other thing would have been valid CSS, but wrong. Um, so that is also a really handy way to use the ampersand. Yeah, it, you, you, exactly. So uh, if you had a you know a button uh, as the top level, and then uh, underneath that nested, you had like red button or something like that, and that that class gets applied to one element. You can nest it and then put the ampersand dot red button, and then when it gets generated, it's dot button no space dot red button, and then the rest of your rule set. That's another handy way. So let's look at at imports. Um, let's take these sort of three example files. Say the, this is our, the sum total of all of the files that we have inside our SAS directory. Um, and we have our styles.scss file, because I haven't mentioned it before, but SAS files, um, the, way, so the way I describe them, end in a .scss, which stands for .sassy CSS. Um, so, Inside our styles.css, these are the only two lines that we have. Um, at import normalize, at import print. Now, at import, of course, looks almost identical to the regular CSS thing, right? But in our, if we were using a normal, regular CSS at import, we would have to say at import, quote, you know, normalize.css, end quote, right? That, that would tell the browser, oh, well, you just downloaded the styles.css file. Now I'm telling you to download this other file. Wasn't that efficient? Uh, yes, that's the way that add imports work. You usually avoid them like the plague in regular CSS. Not so with SAS. Um, well, for one thing, I should go back here. One thing, you don't have to include the file extension at all. So it just knows that it's a .scss file. Why make you type it? So you just type normalize, it knows, oh, I'm looking for the .scss file of this version. No problem. So it looks for those two things. Um, I've given you sort of an example. Not cutting off here, it's cutting off there. Hopefully we will only be missing like one or two characters uh, <laughs> on the screen. It does say normalize here and not normalize. Um, but anyway, so here's some sort of sample uh, CSS, right? It, it's not that exciting what's in here. But what happens is that when it goes to generate the CSS from the styles.scss, converts it into styles.css, Basically what happens is it takes the contents of normalize.scs and the contents of print.scss and combines them into the styles.css file. So instead of doing this really inefficient CSS ad import, it does a very efficient SAS version of ad import, which is basically, it's including the entire content right where you put the ad import. This is pretty handy. Um, now, I should note that uh, SAS will still generate the CSS files for normalize.scss and print.css, because that's the way we've defined them here. So it's going to generate a styles.css that concludes 
you know, the contents of both of those files, but it'll still generate a separate file for normalize.css and print.css. However, if we rename our normalize.scss and print.scss file, whew, I'm really getting tired of saying scss here pretty soon, <laughs> uh, to include an underscore before the name, it is now what's called a partial. And what a partial file means in SAS is when SAS sees that file, it goes, oh, I'm going to completely ignore it. <laughs> so when it generates the, the CSS files, it will not generate a CSS file for any partial file. It will only generate a file for your regularly named un-underscored, whew, that's an awful adjective, uh, styles.css file, right? But our styles.css file includes the contents of the other two files anyway. We don't need them, those are completely superfluous. So converting them to partials means that we, in our generated CSS directory, we've just got the thing that we actually need, which is styles.css. Uh, yeah, and I should point out that inside styles.scss, we actually don't need to make any changes to the code that we had in there in the previous slide. I don't have to specify underscore normalize and underscore print. When SAS sees that, it's basically good, it'll look. It'll say, okay, is there a file called underscore normalize.scss? Uh, yes, right, so I'll just use that one. If there isn't, then it will look for a normalize.scss, right? And if, there, if there's neither of those files in there, it's gonna generate an error. It's gonna go, hey, you told me to import this file. I can't find it, whoop, I'm stopping right here. And it's gonna, instead of generating the styles.css file like we expect, it will generate a single like CSS comment that says, you screwed up and this is why, or this is how, right? Um, this is handy because obviously you don't want to create a bogus ad import statement. Um, and of course, when you reload the browser, you will lose all of your styles and go, what happened? And of course, you'll go and look and then you'll discover what happened. So, super handy feature. Partials, another thing that partials are really handy for is uh, this technique, which uh, Compass called base, uh, the base partial. I just call it the init uh, initialization because basically inside this file um, is you declare all your variables, right? Um, and then you also import all of your modules. I haven't talked about modules yet, um, but they are basically, they're partial files uh, that you uh, download from someplace else, right? They're distributed partial files. Um, so you can import campus, compass and grids, uh, do that inside this one file. Um, and then with our, in our file organization here, if at the top of our styles.scs file, we at import the init, so at import quote init semicolon, if we do that and then import all these other files after that, in all of these files everywhere, we will have the access to all the variables and modules that we included in the init. Right, because from, from the standpoint of SAS, as it's generating this styles.css file, the first thing it did was import the init. And it goes, oh, here's my variables, here's some modules, cool. And then it starts doing all this other stuff and processing these other things, and those variables are now available to them. This is super handy. You, when I first started using SAS, I basically add imported this init file in inside every single file, because I didn't know any better. <laughs> you only need to do it once, in the styles CSS file. So our styles.css file, which uh, I don't have a copy of. Um, well, yeah, it, it, looks, it looks really similar to this, except that at the top it'll say add import, quote, init, semicolon, and then it'll add import all the other CSS files, or all the other SAS files. Um, those of you who mentioned Smacks, I'm trying to do a sort of a Smacks-based uh, file organization. Still working on it, haven't really perfected it yet, but this is where we're at right now. Um, actually, if you're interested in that sort of thing, uh, we're trying to come up with uh, CSS coding standards as well as CSS selector standards and file organization standards for Drupal 8, and we'll be sprinting on this stuff. We already have like a draft that's been through a round of voting and stuff. We'll be going over that at the, on the sprint day on Saturday. Um, so you can come find me and we can talk all about this stuff. Um, 
But at this point, guess what? Everyone in this room has the knowledge that they need in order to do Drupal integration. Seriously. Um, it's really simple. Here's the entire technical document. Inside your .info file, you have a single line that says style sheets, all, uh, pointing at your generated CSS file, CSS slash styles.css. That's it, right? If you want to add a new file to your theme, you basically create an underscore whatever. You add the at import whatever into your styles.css styles.scss file, hit save. You do not need to change the .info file. You do not need to kill Drupal's cache. Yay. <laughs> All you need to do is reload your browser. <laughs> That's it. This is the entire Drupal integration with SAS, right? Now, I know a lot of people say there's a module for that. Um, I have. I, I wrote a book on module development. I wrote that exact thing in my <laughs> book on Drupal 7 module development. Um, but in this case, I put a little asterisk there because that actually refers to completely screwing up your CSS. Um, <laughs> and the reason is the Drupal modules that try to do, to try to integrate SAS, the only way they're able to do that is by using a, it's, a, it's basically a fork of SAS. Because SAS is written in the Ruby language, and they decided, hey, in order to integrate with Drupal, we'll use this fork of the normal SAS that's been rewritten in PHP. And a PHP version of SAS equals a buggy version of SAS. It's not extremely buggy, but it's subtly buggy, which is way worse. <laughs> so if you see a module in SAS that, or that for Drupal that says it can do SAS stuff, ignore it. <laughs> um, so like, we've learned a lot of stuff. And I hope you see that the amount of time that we're, we're doing stuff, just based on the stuff that we've learned, we've already started to speed up a little bit. Right? Right? We're, we're typing less stuff. We're able to, uh, you know, it, it, using partials, we could now like copy an entire file from one old project to a new file in, in the new project, right? So there's some speeding up there that we can do there. Um, still not Superman yet, but we're getting faster. Extends and placeholders. Extends. Uh, this is a concept that just got introduced into SAS 3.2. Basically, it's super new. It, it got released in like, mm, anybody know the date? I think it was like September or something. It just came out. It's really new, but it's really powerful. That's why this is such an early slide in my presentation, although, yeah, we've been doing this 48 minutes. Uh, <laughs> here is a placeholder selector. Instead of the normal like dot, element invisible, which would be a normal CSS class selector, or you know, pound signed element, uh, element invisible, which would be an ID CSS selector. Uh, we use the percentage sign, which is a special selector to SAS that says, when you are generating this CSS, don't actually do anything with this. Just don't generate any CSS. So by itself, this makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> but <laughs> step two, <laughs> we can use the at extend. So inside this normal selector, we were at extending the placeholder selector, so percent element invisible. And what happens here is that now uh, SAS basically says, OK, this selector is extending this other invisible you know, placeholder selector. I'm going to copy this selector and put it here in its place. So it'll now generate this entire rule set, but using the selector that we've put here. So dot example becomes the selector that's used in the generated CSS. Here, example two is doing the same thing, extend. So its selector is also copied up to here. So we have dot example, comma, dot example two, bracket, and then the normal stuff that's inside this placeholder selector. And just for, just to give you an example, clear idea of what's actually going on here. Here we've got you know, color red added to the example. And you can see it's still generated there, but it's, it's separate, right? Because the ex extend tells SAS, 
copy the selector to where the placeholder is. So at extend percent element invisible will copy this selector up. So copy the selector up, copies this selector up, and then it still generates this, this rule set, color red. This is really, really powerful. Go ahead. Assign all of these properties to a variable. So the, so the question is, could you take all these properties from the, um, from the placeholder selector and copy it to a variable? The answer is no, but there's something really similar to that, which is the next slide. Um, so the, the reason why this is super powerful, of course, is that we can write a bunch of these really useful placeholder selectors, like element invisible. A lot of people use this selector a lot of times. They're, they're like clear fix is another great one. You could create a clear fix placeholder to sort of define it at the top of your file and then organize your SAS the way you want to organize it. And when you need clear fix on a particular, or, you know, added to a particular element inside that selector, you just say add extend percent clear fix, right? It will copy the selector from there to the top of your file where you have the placeholder, right? So when you're read, when you're like, say this is not line nine, but nine thousand. Please don't be nine thousand, but you know what I mean. Way down at the bottom of the page, you still have a clear example of what's going on, what this selector actually does. It's extending element invisible, right? If I was just using normal CSS and I was down here at line nine thousand, I would have no idea that way at the top of the file, I was also using that same selector. You you lose it in normal CSS but it's completely transparent, really obvious inside your SAS. Great, yeah. Sorry? You use a variable here? Oh, inside here? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can use variables. You can use nesting even inside a placeholder selector. Um, I don't believe that you can nest a placeholder inside a placeholder. You would, uh, <laughs> the thing that's nested inside the placeholder would have to be a regular selector. <laughs> um, but that would, that would, for example, allow you to create a placeholder selector. I'm just shooting the breeze here, like a percent menu placeholder selector. And then nested inside that would be like dot menu link, right? And it wouldn't generate that nested thing until you actually extend it. Right, and then it would, yeah, it would work. It would work exactly the way you would expect it to work, hopefully. Um, sorry, hopefully your expectations are what it would do. <laughs> but it will work exactly the way I expect it to work. Mixins. Mixins are kind of the opposite of extending in that you define a mixin, you say, okay, um, I'm, whoops. I'm defining a mixin, um, and it's kind of like a kind of like a PHP function, um, but you specify the yeah, this one. you specify the properties you want to this mixin, and you're saying that um, this is basically the label for my mixin, um, and uh, you can pass in parameters here like PHP functions. So you can uh, specify that this first parameter is radius. This is this variable here is basically so you can use this parameter variable inside your mixin wherever you want. Um, and the default value is going to be five pixels. So if you don't include a value when you're calling this mixin, it'll default to five pixels. Um, and how do we use them? Pretty easy, actually. You just add include rounded corners. Here we're using it without the parameter. And so when it gets generated, it's using the default five pixel variable here. Um, and then here, uh, we're adding, we're passing seven pixels as a radius. Um, and it gets generated out, and then it's using seven pixels. Um, so basically, instead of like an extend in placeholder selectors, you're copying the selector from one spot up to the placeholder. Here, you're copying the properties from the mixin into the uh, into your rule set. Right. So we're we're copying properties instead of copying selectors. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Okay. That's another slide. There's like two more slides. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's exciting. People who know SAS are like, this is actually really exciting. So again, 
Fiddly, you can, you can actually play along at home. Go to that URL. Um, it'll pull up the Sassmeister, and you'll be able to like play and modify it. You can change that to 20 pixels. Go nuts, you know. <laughs> right? Um, so mixins. These are really powerful, right? So like this, this mixin that I wrote right here for round and quarters is really lame because it, it completely ignores all the vendor prefixes. But could you? S oh, yeah. Yeah. So the, the question is, could in, in here, instead of passing an, an actual value of 7px, could you pass in a variable here? So say somewhere at the top of your, uh, top of your file or inside your init.stss file, you'd specify that standard roundy is you know, 20 pixels, right? That's the variable you create, standard roundy. And you put dollar sign standard roundy right there. And it would just spit out exactly like, like you expect. Um, so mixins are really powerful, but having to write all of your own mixins is, you know, it's, it's the, you know, I'm going to build everything by myself mentality, right? But we have this great thing called Compass. And basically what it is is it's a library of mixins, right? And so you don't have to write all of the stuff yourself. Like CSS3, the rounded corner one, that's already in Compass. You don't have to write a lot of stuff. You can just reuse what other people use, right? You're using Drupal. You understand this concept of open source, right? That's what Compass is. It's a library of mixins on top of SAS. Oh, man, I'm so, so. There's good news, I promise. I'm running way late, but there's good news. Um, I'll go through the super fast data URIs. Here's something you can do with Compass. Um, if you s normally, normal CSS, you specify the URL to a particular image, right? And basically what this tells the browser is like, okay, you've just downloaded the CSS. Now also go download this PNG file um, and, and use it in this way, right? In SAS, Instead of using URL, we can say inline image um, and then the name of the PNG file. Um, Compass actually knows where your images are inside your theme because you tell it where it is. Um, there's, an, there's a topic that I'm not going to be able to cover called config.rb. You basically specify, hey, this is where my CSS is. This is where my, my SAS is. These are where my images are. So these are the paths to them. So you don't have to keep repeatedly specify the path to your, to your images. It just says, go look in the images and find this one, um, and we're going to inline image it. And what it does is when it generates the CSS, it actually creates a data URI. So instead of like the regular like relative URL here, it's a data URL, data colon and image. And then it's, it's base64 encoded the entire image and inlined it in the CSS. The browser no longer has to do a separate painful HTTP request. It's right there inside the CSS file. Um, this is great for small files. Not so good for really big files, <laughs> um, but really good for CSS small files like you know, messages and menu stuff. Great place for it. How supported is Base64 encoded? I think it's like IE, w with small images, IE8 and later su support data URIs. So, um, and, and you can, have, you can like come up with a strategy for dealing with IE6 and 7 if you want to. Um, uh, Vendor prefixes. So we've all used this site, I assume. Uh, can I use .com or something like that? Um, and trying to find out, okay, what are the exact vendor prefixes I need for this exact CSS3 property? I can never remember. I have to go look it up. Uh, right? I hate that. So instead, we're just going to do add import compass because uh, you know all these GUI apps and the command line, we've already installed compass, so it's available. So we say add import compass, and SAS goes, oh, okay. Um, I'm going to go look where Compass is installed, found it. It's going to import all these modules. Uh, and one of them is a CSS3 module that has a mixin called Border Radius, which is the way cooler and better version of Border Radius than the one I wrote earlier. And when it generates a CSS, it's going to generate all of those stupid vendor prefixes for you. <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> this is Awesome. Never have to worry about vendor prefixes again. Just go, go to the online documentation, compassstyle.org, find out all about the different CSS3 prefixes, 
this is fantastic, right? Compass has a lot of stuff like CSS3. Um, it has these data URIs. It, it does sprites. Uh, this thing is incredible. I don't have time to talk about it because it's like easily like half hour, 45 minute topic just in itself. But you basically say, okay, I want to build this sprite from these five images that are in this directory. Go and build that sprite for me. And it goes, okay. And it does. Like, it's, it's ridiculously simple. It's like five lines of code. Every time you modify the image, it goes and generates a new sprite for you. It's just so awesome. I can't believe it. <laughs> um, Zen Grids. Zen Grids is basically, it's a library that I wrote um, that specifically, uh, it, it works with Compass, but it's for layouts, right? So Zen Grids allows you to create a responsive, flexible layout. Um, and uh, Compass and Zen Grids, they can basically, they can turn you into Superman, right? You're starting to get this, this power of all these different things. Um, and I would love to talk for another hour, but <laughs> there's a buff tomorrow <laughs> where we can continue talking about this stuff. Can I just add half a minute? Sure. Because you sort of transitioned me from yeah. one topic to a simple one, which is like what? Um, I just talked about organizers and sort of people deploying to cloud. We have this thing called Klarna. Um, and anybody who uses Klarna now knows that it's fucked up. Yeah, I'm going to wrap up here in like four minutes, and then we can do QA for, but you, you are free to what leave now. That's totally cool. Um, so, can't finish all this stuff. It's a complex or deep uh, topic, right? I love talking about it. We're going to have a boff tomorrow, 1045, um, and you are free to like just bombard me with questions afterwards as well. Um, so, Zen Grids is the way that I decided to sort of share. I, I knew a lot about layouts. Um, if you ever use Zen, the sort of original version of Zen, if you ever looked at those layout files, the CSS, it's massively complex CSS. There's lots of negative margins in there, but it builds a rock solid layout. But it's really hard to modify. The CSS is crazy. Um, and there was no way for me to make it simpler. So Zen Grids is like ridiculously easy for me to, to create a layout. And I guess I will show you that real fast since we have a little bit more time. Um, yeah, there we go. So zengrids.com. Um, I have my little manifesto. No, no, not this file. This page here. On the home page, I have my little manifesto of why uh, layouts in CSS is really hard and why you must use SAS of some kind. There are other layout modules besides Zen Grids. There's a module called SUSY, S-U-S-Y, which is also very popular. Singularity, um, those are also other ones you can use instead of Zen Grids. Um, this is the one that I developed because I thought it had sort of unique features that I really liked. Um, so, so building a layout, like using all that complicated CSS is completely hidden from you. All you need to do is like add import Zen, you specify how many columns you want in your grid, column grid count of seven, how much space you want in between each grid. Uh, in this case, we're going to do a fixed gutter of like, you know, uh, 10 pixels in this case, which is not very much but gutter, but it's an example. Um, and we've got seven columns. And of course, we, because it's a responsive layout, we want to use percentage widths on our columns. But we can still use a fixed gutter because I know how to do it in the CSS. But you don't have to know about the complicated CSS in order to get this to work. It's using, um, and then we specify, we just add this container here, which adds in some sort of little magic to the container. And then each of our individual grid items, we start laying out in our grid. Um, here we're applying uh, to this aside one. We are applying this mixin, Zen grid item. And uh, we're basically, these parameters, these two parameters is all it takes. Four here, the four says that make this grid item span four of our columns in our grid. And the three says make that item start in the third column over from the left, right? So one, two, three, we're starting there, and then it spans another four columns, right? Or not another four columns, it spans, you know, four columns total, right? Um, 
And uh, then this last one, we're doing the same thing. We want it to span one column starting in this seven column you know, from the left. Right? Um, and here's how we start a new row. Uh, every time we want to start a new row, because um, basically these are the HTML source order as well. Um, so the next item in the row, we just say, OK, Zen clear. That starts a new row. We can talk about this more tomorrow. But this is all you need as far as the code and Zen grids. It's pretty straightforward, pretty easy. And this is the layout that it actually generates. Um, this is a live code example here. And if I can grab the side here and yeah, you can see that it, it really is completely flexible. It's a fluid grid. And yet the gutters are a fixed width. They're staying at 10 pixels, right? So we, we used like, what is this, 10, 11 lines of code. And we've generated an entire, all the CSS for this entire layout. Um, it's super powerful, super easy to get to, to learn. Um, and we can talk about it more afterwards if you want to come up with it later and at the boss. And this session was titled CSS is for Superman, or sorry, CSS is for Clark Kent, SAS is for Superman. But as I started actually doing this presentation and coming up with it, I realized that when we start sharing and collaborating like this, we can basically build off of each other. And I've already started to see this, right? So I wrote this Zen Grids, which allows you to create a layout really easy. But I didn't have a really good sense of how to deal with breakpoints, because you don't want to have to keep writing your breakpoints over and over again all over the place. But I didn't have a good solution for it. So I left breakpoint completely out of Zen Grids. It's not included as a part of it. But somebody else went and wrote another module that's called, appropriately, the breakpoint module. And it is fantastic, it's exactly what I would have wrote if I had you know, had the time and the inclination to actually do it. I'm like, yay! <laughs> so, um, and that, that's actually written by, uh, oh, uh, Mason, it's Canary Mason on Twitter, and his actual name is Wendell Mason or Mason Wendell? Thank you. <laughs> um, and he works at, um, Anyone? <laughs> He's a Drupal person. Um, he works at ZivTech. Um, and so both he and I have shared stuff with the Compass and SAS community. And we're, we're, you know, we just happen to be also Drupal people, right? So by sharing this stuff and working together, we're able to leverage the, the knowledge and the experience of this vast group of people. And you guys don't have to learn about how to build a layout anymore. You can just use one of these modules that's already available. SUSE or Zen Grids or Singularity.js, which is built by um, a, another guy in the SAS community, uh, co-developed with another Drupal person. Right? There's a lot of Drupal people using SAS already. Um, we can work together. And what happens if we all shared? If we're you know, all superheroes, what do we get? <laughs> The Justice League of America. Hell yes. <laughs> Thank you. So, feel free to leave, but you can all stay for questions. Um, what did you think? Uh, I created a convenient bit.ly URL, so you can go straight to the, uh, uh, you know, it's a bit.ly. I love Superman. I hope that in no way influences your uh, <laughs> session review. <laughs> um, but you can also follow me on Twitter, at John Albin, and uh, feel free to stalk me the rest of the conference. <laughs> Questions? Oh, there. there. How do I deal with uh, margin and padding in Zen Grids? So, um, if you read the documentation, it's, it, it spells it out exactly the way that it actually works. Um, the way that we, the, the magic CSS that's being used is a property called box sizing. Um, I actually did a, a, a blog post on Palantir.net uh, recently that talked about the actual sort of underlying CSS technique that's used in Zen Grids. Um, it uses this box sizing property that the, the, the normal box sizing model is basically your 
your width ver or your width property specifies um, what is it? It specifies the width of the content, not including padding or borders. Right? I'm completely messed up. Right? That's like saying, okay, I want to add padding to this box. Obviously, I'm going to automatically make the box bigger when I put padding in it. It's, or, I don't know. It's just crazy. So there's a box sizing content box, box dash, yeah, box dash sizing colon content dash box semicolon. Um, that allows you the padding and, and border to be interior to the width. So since we need to use percentage values for our columns, right? We you know use 10% for the width of the column, and we're just going to use box sizing content box and then specify that the padding is 10 pixels on the other side, right? So it, the, the gutter value that you set in Zen Grids is cut in half, and then it puts half of that, that gutter value as padding on the interior. Um, I am working on a new version of, of Zen Grids that will allow you to also specify the margin in between it. Uh, Morton was, was bitching about that. <laughs> so I, I'm working on that, but that's the way it works in Zen Grids 1. So, yeah, I know, crazy, huh? Martin was bitching. <laughs> Any other questions? I know it's like 6.15, you're like. <laughs> I love those. I love esoteric questions. <laughs> Here. Put the video. All right, okay. Thanks. Could I just uh, say uh, thank you very much for your work and your presentation as well. Um, it, it took me a little while to fully grok what was going on with Zen Grids, but I, you know, I appreciated that I could use Zen, uh, Zen Theme, Zen 5 without using Zen Grids, and I could use you know, SAS without using anything, of course. It took me a little while because I'm used to CSS frameworks uh, like you know 960 GS or Blueprint or things like that to realize that the magic of Zen Grids is that it works with anything, with any crappy class selectors. Because what you're doing, instead of taking the class selectors that the grid framework requires that you use, you're taking the class selectors that Drupal crappily handed you and then apply a mix into it to make it behave like a grid framework. So thank you. It took me a while, but I got there. So, m so my real question, though, <laughs> is I thought I'd just say that because it wasn't immediately clear to me that I had to turn my head upside down, even that, you know, we're from the Antipodes. Um, my real question is, so it came, I was trying to apply uh, Zen grid layouts to panels. So there's a lot of code in panels. There's a lot of nesting. If you add, you know, and then you add views and you add fields and there's a lot of nesting. So I see that there's a uh, Zen nested container. Is it Zen nested container or Zen nested item? Sometimes it... To be, to be honest, I don't, I don't have all of the mixins for Zen Grids memorized either. I'm constantly looking at my own documentation. <laughs> it's good documentation. <laughs> so there are, there are a few variants on Z, uh, Zen Grid container and Zen Grid item. And one of them is this nested container, which is, I believe, for when you have a... A, an item that is also a container of more items. Okay, so th the problem is that I, I think I'm getting into, and, and I'm not sure how I should solve it in the John Alban way, uh, is <laughs> sometimes those, those containers that I want to create new items inside of are children of other Zen items, but they're not immediate. Ch they're not the same object. So it's nested multiple levels down. So I've got a container, and some, uh, and then some items, and then inside that I've got a few more divs because it's panels, <laughs> and then I've got another container with more items. And the thing that I'm that I'm trying to get rid of is the uh, padding on the left and the right of the first and last items. Right. So, um, so Zen uh, Zen. Nested container, whatever the heck the name of that. Let's let's go look at our documentation here because I don't remember. Reference link. Um, Zen nested container. Um, you can only apply this to a, uh, a the same element that is also a grid item. So if it's um, if if it's a grid item on a sort of larger grid. You can apply this nested grid, and it'll basically it basically removes the padding that I was talking about that we're using for gutters. 
because then inside this nested grid, you know, all of those children must also be gr grid items now inside this new container, this new nested container. So it removes the padding because the children all have the same padding, right? So we don't want to double up on our padding for this nested container. That's what the nested containers thing is about. Your problem is that there's padding somewhere in this vast jungle of divs um, in between the actual grid item and where your children are, right? Um, removing it by hand is perfectly acceptable um, if it really has to be, like somewhere in the middle there. Um, I would say that probably, yes, right. So the, the subtle thing to rec recognize about these containers is that inside the container, you can only have grid items. You can't have grid items and some like regular paragraph content that's just flowing around because the containers are just gonna go smashing on the top of your, your, your flowing content or, or vice versa, your flowing content is gonna throw the grid items way out of whack. You can't, you can't combine stuff, you can't con combine flow stuff and grid item stuff inside a container, right? So flow stuff goes inside a grid item. Um, so, so you should be applying the nested container to the actual grid item, and if that, if that gets rid of all the padding that you want, then great, you're done, right? If there's some padding somewhere else, then you're just gonna have to remove it by hand. And just, so the, when you specify a container, um, and say there's like eight levels of divs underneath that before you get to any children items, that should be fine as long as there's no layout CSS being applied to any of those levels of divs. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, we, we, yeah. So the nested container is used instead of Zen container for that nested container, right? Did I say something else besides border box when I was giving the example? Oops, no, content box is the default. Border box is the one that I actually use. Yeah, yeah. sorry. <laughs> We did not go, I mean, these end grid questions are great, but for those of you who are like, I have no idea what they're talking about. Um, there's actually a webinar. It was like a, an hour and a half long um, that Aqua and Palantir did together that, that I was presenting on. Um, so there's video of me giving a presentation that's just on how you can use Zen grids inside Drupal. Right? So that's a great resource. Any other questions? Great, thank you so much, I appreciate it.